Hello, I'm Tom Parg from Berry Consultants, and in this video, I'm going to talk to you about our fixed and adaptive clinical trial simulator called FACTS. So FACTS is this powerful platform that allows you to design, simulate, and compare fixed and adaptive clinical trial designs. You access it through this interactive graphical user interface, which is very complicated, but it doesn't require any programming to use. Everything is done by selecting options and this means you can create and modify designs very quickly and very easily and very reliably. Behind the graphic user interface, we have these simulation engines that have been written in C++, a good low-level language. That means the simulations are run extremely quickly, far faster than if you've written a simulator in R, for instance, running 10, 100 times faster than that. And FAX allows you to switch on and off these options in a very uh, easy and controlled way to explore the different combinations of design options in your trials. And it produces this very comprehensive output, which is easily loaded into R and post-processed uh, and further explored, although FAX itself has some rich charting and uh, graphing uh, features for showing you the results. And we believe, and we've, indeed we've been told, that FAX is simply the best clinical trial simulator that's available. What FAX isn't is it's not a design repository, it's not analysis software like bugs or R or SAS. It doesn't do simple sample size calculations like nQuery or PASS. And it's not focused on closed form analysis, the sort of group sequential designs that EAST and Adplan do. Instead, FAX allows you to create your unique tailored solution to your particular trial problem. And why would you want to simulate designs? Simulation designs is one that is something that's uh, increasingly on the rise, but it's not traditionally taught as the way that the trials are uh, designed and built, which concentrate, of course, on things like sample size calculations and power calculations. And we believe that only through simulating the, your design can you properly understand it and get a good understanding of how your trial may perform. It also helps us remove the constraints of closed form analysis so we can use more sophisticated statistical methods. And one of the things we've learned through doing it is quite surprisingly is how much it improves how we as statisticians can communicate what the design is doing to the rest of the clinical team. So in FACTS, what we have done is to break up the type of trial that uh, you can design in FACTS into uh, four distinct types. They have the dose escalation designs, phase one cancer trial type designs. We have the FACTS core, the dose finding, treatment comparison and confirmatory trial type designs where you're comparing uh, one or more arms against a control arm. And we have continuous, uh, an option which deals with continuous endpoint or dichotomous endpoints. We have one which does uh, multiple endpoints, which can be up to f a combination of four continuous or dichotomous endpoints. And one that does time to event or survival endpoints with an option to include an, another endpoint, which is typically some kind of earlier predictor. Then we have the enrichment designs. This is where your trial contains multiple subgroups or multiple indications, and you're testing a single treatment across those different types. And again, we have continuous, dichotomous, and time to event versions. And then lastly, there are what we call stage designs, which is perhaps not a, a terribly informative name. And what this is really allows you to do is to simulate a fax core type design, the, to where you're testing multiple arms, followed by a subsequent design. So typically you might be simulating a phase two followed by a phase three. Um, you, it also includes the option then, rather than doing them completely separately, to combine them in a seamless study where you've got pre-specified transition from one stage to the other. So now we'll look at the, those four different classes of design and we'll look a little bit more detail at the, the features that FACS has in each class. So starting with the dose escalation, what we have is uh, the primary module is this Bayesian logistic regression model. And within that, uh, you've got options where you can target a toxicity range rather than just a, a maximum tolerated dose. You can incorporate overdose control to limit the possibility of toxicity or the likelihood of seeing toxicity in the trial. There are rich escalation and stopping rules that you can add on top of uh, the simple uh, go until you've finished all your, used all your cohorts. And then there are options for, for instance, having two samples in the trial uh, where it might be you've got an adult and a pediatric population. Um, you can also have additional endpoints, so you can have efficacy and toxicity observed in the same trial. And you can do things like have fine grain dosing. So instead of just, uh, say, six or eight fixed doses, you have the ability to then 
uh, once you've got close to your target, to adjust by smaller than, than a whole dose step. And then lastly, as well as options for doing the simulation of the trial in the traditional way of enrolling cohorts, we also have this continuous enrollment option uh, where subjects are recruited continuously and allocated to the, the best dose of the time, along with rules for capping you know, how many are being exposed at what might be a dose that we are uncertain about the toxicity at the time. And we have options for simulating MTPI and 3 plus 3 designs uh, where you can use the same scenarios and the same basic rules and see how the Bayesian logistic regression uh, compares to those. Then in FACS Core, which is our dose finding treatment arm comparison set of design engines, these are for two arm or multi arm studies. The arms can be a dose range, so you can, you can select from a range of dose response models in how you model the uh, response on those, or they can be completely separate treatments and you just compare them in a pairwise way with a common control arm. And that allows you, for instance, to simulate a, something like an umbrella trial. There are options for longitudinal modeling, so if the time to the endpoint uh, is significant compared to the accrual time, uh, we can increase the amount of information that's available as the trial is running, so available at interims, uh, by employing longitudinal models that can either be set up in a non-informative way so that they learn during the trial and all their uh, modeling is based simply on the data you've seen in the trial, or you can set them up with quite informed priors based on uh, past data uh, from, from previous trials, which will increase how much data you have at the early interims when you've got very few completers. There are facilities for incorporating historical data on the control arm, and of course we have the full range of adaptations available where you can specify interims and different timings for interims and different types of adaptation. You can do the basic early stopping, but you can also do arm dropping and response adaptive randomization. And then in the enrichment designs module, this is for comparing the performance of a treatment either against a historical control or an actual control in a range of different subgroups or possibly different indications, such as you might have in a basket trial. You can have this as a single arm or a control arm, but, but not multiple arms. And then there are options, again, for longitudinal modeling and inclusion of historical data on control. Uh, within the interims, we can now stop individual groups, uh, either for success or futility. An analysis can be by individual group. It can be overall across all groups. Or it can use a Bayesian hierarchical model where we borrow across the groups uh, according to how similar the responses in the groups are. The more similar they are, the, the more we borrow, the less similar they are, the, the less we borrow between the groups. And then there's the slightly oddly named stage design simulation, and this allows us to simulate a sequence of two trials, such as a phase two followed by a phase three. But it can also simulate a seamless trial, such as a seamless phase two, three, or even a seamless 2A, 2B trial. So you've got a proof of concept followed by a more detailed dose finding stage. There are rules for specifying what arms that are being tested in the first stage are then carried forward to the second stage. And there are rules that you can specify uh, on how much information or how much data uh, from the first stage can be used in the second stage. It's also possible to do a completely different analysis in the second stage compared to the first stage. So you might, for instance, have a, a PFS compared to overall survival, or you might have a measure of efficacy like uh, cholesterol lowering in the first stage, but then the second stage is primarily about proving safety. So the way these simulations are all structured in all the different types of simulation engine are uh, that, first of all, FAX simulates the patient responses. So for each patient, that might be a single response or it might be response over uh, multiple visits. The FAX then simulates the accrual of the patients and the timing up to the next interim or the first interim. And then it extracts from the simulated patient data the data that would be visible at that interim. So that, depending on uh, the accrual rate, that'll be a number of subjects who've been accrued and some of them will be, might be complete, but others might be incomplete and you only have partial data. Whatever it is, FAX correctly extracts that data from the simulated patients and it doesn't do its interim analysis on anything that wouldn't be there uh, in the actual trial. So then it performs the analysis it derives the quantities of interest, the estimates, the Bayesian posterior probabilities, p-values, Bayesian predictive probabilities. And these then feed into the specified decisions that have been 
uh, that the, you, the user, have created in the design, and from those out come the, the results of those decisions given the values of the quantities of interest. And those are then fed back uh, into the further recruitment. So you may have dropped an arm now and no longer be recruiting subjects on a particular treatment arm. The decision might, of course, be to fill it and go to the final analysis. But we loop around until we do reach the final analysis and then the final analysis is carried out uh, and that's included in the, the, the final results. So, and then in the output of the simulation results, we get a record of how long the trial ran for, how many subjects were accrued, when it stopped, why it stopped, uh, and what the data looked like uh, when it did stop. So the technical structure of FACTS is that we have a separate graphical user interface, which we use for all the FACTS designs. And then behind the, the scenes, as it were, we have the different simulation engines, or design engines, as we also call them. And they'll be specific to the particular kind of trial that you're designing. FACTS stores all the parameters you enter into this fax file, uh, which is very convenient. It means you can then send this fax file to a colleague or to Berry Consultants uh, in order to pass on your design. And we can load that .fax file up in a version of FACTS, and we will get exactly the same res simulation results that you do. So if, if you're emailing us and saying, you know, why is my design not working or why is fax failing here, we'll be able to diagnose that from just you sending us the fax file. And similarly, sharing with colleagues, you can share the fax file and say, yeah, this is as far as I've taken the design so far, and they'll be able to rerun the simulations and see exactly what the same operating characteristics that you've got. Behind the scenes, fax will output the parameters that the simulation engine needs in a sort of a more uh, engineering style uh, parameter file. And then fax will launch as many of copies of the design, right design engine as you have cores on your laptop and so it'll get the simulations all done in parallel. You also have options for offloading that onto a server or to a compute grid and run even more copies of the simulation engines in, in parallel. And then eventually all the results come back, they're collated by the user interface into the output files, uh, and we have your results, and the user interface presents them to you in the summary tables and in the graphs that it has built in. The results are in increasing degrees of detail. So you get a summary file, which is very useful for looking at very quickly to see how well the simulations have performed, whether you've got the kind of probability of success that you are expecting or the control of type 1 error. Then there's a second file which contains the results for each individual simulation as a single row. And that's particularly useful for post-processing if you want to do a different or a more complicated analysis than FAX has done. Then behind that, we have what we call the weeks files, which show the results for each simulation uh, at each interim so you can do even more detailed post-processing if necessary. And behind that, you, you have the patient's files. So this is the uh, output of all the simulated patients in each of the simulated trials. So you could do a completely different analysis and compare how that works uh, against what FAX has done. And FAX does everything behind this consistent user interface. So all these different engines and different design types sit behind this, this one interface, which starts up here and essentially basically says, well, what kind of design do you want to work on? And you have this list down the left-hand side of the different design choices. And then you've also got access, of course, to designs you've uh, already been working on uh, or folders where you've got a number of designs you want to select from. And the basic process that we see uh, over and over again is that uh, as, a, as the biostatistician interacts with the clinical team, they typically create a very simple uh, design, in fact, that represents the broad outline of the, the trial that the team are thinking of running. And even at that level, you begin to flush out uh, the assumptions the team are making. Uh, you, they have a better understanding of how the trial may meet their goals. You get a better understanding of what their goals actually are and the kind of trade-offs uh, that they might be prepared to make. And then you create simulations. You look at ex individual example trials, overall operating characteristics. And again, more and more, you and the team uh, become uh, uh, unified ar around designing this particular trial. And as the design gets updated, uh, you begin to uh, flush out what that team's actual uncertainties are about the trial, and maybe that guides you into the kind of adaptations that the trial needs to be able to make. So finally, the process converges to a design, which then enables you to write up the, the details of the design and the operating characteristics of, of the design, how it's going to perform in the different scenarios you've explored. So I hope that's whetted your appetite for learning more about facts, and you can learn more 
uh, from uh, the documents and the videos uh, on the Berry Consultants website. Uh, so some of those videos will take you through specific worked examples of using facts on some simple designs. So I hope you've enjoyed that and thank you very much for watching. Thank you.